right, so yeah, here's, I'm going to be writing a brief overview of the CCPP single column model, a very brief. I, I, you know, I, I have in the past gone into to more detail than I'm going to go to now um, because I, I want to leave some time to walk through some of the uh, connections to the CCPP and, and you know, provide some reinforcement by looking at actual examples of some of the things that we talked about this morning. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so many of you have probably seen this slide before, probably many times, um, especially if you've listened to Mike Eck, he likes to, he likes to show this. But uh, it's a great way to understand uh, the value of a single column model. Um, as we all know, forecasting the weather is famously and devilishly a, a complicated task. And so um, matching the complexity of the atmosphere in a model is a tall order. Um, and the sources of air creep in from many different angles. So, um, and of course, you know, the complexity of the model means that errors interact and they, they quickly compound. Um, so one way to try to make progress in improving the complex weather models is to sort of eliminate that complexity in stages and to try to make progress with components of the model individually. So a single column model is super useful in this regard because it isolates a model's physics and reduces some of uh, the model error feedbacks. And this is ultimately why single column models continue to play a role um, amongst much more powerful and skillful models uh, at the world's best weather forecasting centers around the world, um, just because of the, you know this useful quality. And uh, I, mean, I don't think anybody's saying that the, using a single column model is sufficient for improving your weather model's performance because it just, it just isn't. Even with you know millions of cases, it's still it's still not <laughs> it's still not sufficient. But uh, it certainly is a, a powerful arrow you know in the physics developer's quiver in in my opinion and then a lot of other people's opinions as well. Um, so beyond the scientific value, um, the, single, the CCPP single column model is useful for a couple of other reasons. Um, so back in 2016, um, the budding UFS was in, in need of a well-supported single column model. Um, there had been an older SEM version of the, the GSM-based GFS um, used by Fang Lin, Morthy, and Laura Davies, and I'm sure others at EMC. But it, it had kind of stopped being maintained and um, updated as the GFS physics marched on, and um, also, you know, as the as the CCPP came into being, there was this kind of natural marriage because the CCPP requires a host model to to run, and uh, you know, we needed a single column model. So, a single column model it's the the simplest possible host model that can exercise an entire physics suite, and um, plus the, the single column model's simplicity pays dividends for you know, rapid development and, and for software releases and things like that. So um, quite a few uses for a relatively simple um, piece of code. Um, so hopefully I've made the case why we should care about single column models in general and the CCPP single column model in particular. Um, the, the latest release, um, as others have mentioned, is version 6.0, um, which was up to date with NOAA's operational GFS version 16 physics. Um, this released, um, as well as the latest code, is available on GitHub, as we've been saying, and it was bundled with the last uh, CCPP version 6 release. Uh, and this code contains uh, CCP physics and CCPP framework as submodules, as discussed earlier. Okay, so um, for, whoops, for forcing uh, the single column model, there are several um, complementary ways uh, to do so. Um, the first is by deriving initial conditions and forcing from field campaign observations. And uh, this is especially useful because cases made in this way have you know, actual truth to compare to. Um, so it's you know, very popular in, in the literature and uh, quite useful for, for uh, tuning physics and, and understanding uh, you know, physics deficiencies. Uh, second, um, idealized cases um, are fantastic for exploring, you know, the entire parameter space and understanding the range of, of physics responses as, as you change, you know, um, base cases in, in small ways. Like that there's a, a somewhat famous uh, um, Aztecs uh, case that's based on the Aztecs field, field campaign where um, it was 
trying to understand the pace of the transition between stratocumulus and cumulus, and they made idealized cases based off of you know this base observational case to try to tweak the speed of this transition. And using these idealized cases with various sets of physics can tell you a lot about um, what to expect when it, when it is run in the global model about you know how large the extent of, of stratocumulus is off of you know the western coastal continents things like that. Um, so certainly a, a useful tool. And then third, uh, driving a signal column model from three dimensional model output is is also fantastic um, to, to be able to focus on say problem areas for the more complex model and for understanding how physics changes might affect the the full weather forecast at least you know, locally. So um, the CCPP single column model relies on on all of these methods. Um, and um, we've already talked about this a little bit, but the, this slide was was borrowed from Mike Eck, uh, and it shows some of the cases available to use with the CCPP single column model. Um, and I'll say, you know, a particular note are the cases um, available from the the DEFI repository that Dustin mentioned, it's a relatively new um, collection of cases that goes along with that. You know, internationally or becoming internationally adopted file format uh, for for single column model cases. This DEFI form is, is relatively new. It's within the last two or three years, and uh, you know, a group of folks got together and you know agreed that hey, this is a good idea. We why are we all using um, you know proprietary formats for our single column models when it's it it is pretty easy to to standardize. So it's actually been been great, and we've participated in in uh, some of those those meetings and. I've been taking advantage of their their case repository, um, but but I, I do say like beyond this repository, we'd like to see an umbrella repository that has you know accepts cases from what we have with the CCPP single column model, the DEFI repo, and if there are others out there, I know that E3SM also has a has a single column model, and they they have their own collection of cases. So um, you know, I, in my opinion, the, the more the better, um, and to to have a, a single repo where someone can can uh, easily get cases that have, you know, forcing for, you know, whatever meteorological uh, scenario that they're interested in, I think it would be really nice. So uh, we'd definitely like to participate and, and see that happen. Um, okay, so, so forcing the, the CCPP single column model from the UFS is a relatively recent capability that was added. And there are a couple of ways to do this. Um, one shoots for as close to bit for bit reproduction of the UFS column as possible by outputting um, the diagnostic dynamics tendencies every physics time set from the US at UFS. And that this was implemented first. And this requires quite a bit more, you know, computation time and storage because it's it's a lot of extra data that, you, that you're outputting. And plus, you know, I say plus plus the foresight to, the foresight to turn this functionality on um, when when you're running a UFS. So it's it's not really amenable to um, you know, seeing your, your standard UFS forecast and then after the fact, oh, I want to check out, I want to zoom in on, on this problem area with a single column model. So a, a uh, new capability was uh, implemented um, and it's you know, perhaps maybe a less accurate reproduction of the UFS column, um, but it, it, it uses the, the default variables that are output from the UFS history files. And it's incredibly useful for that reason and uh, can be used on any UFS output data sets. Um, so this was this was Dustin's work. And he, he uh, um, did, did some great work to show how the original column output compares to the same columns uh, using the single column model. Um, uh, this slide and the previous one were, were copied from him, so credit to Dustin. Um, the, the figures on the left show mean differences between the UFS and single column model columns, like a, a collection of them. Um, when the single column model is forced using six hourly output. So it's definitely quite a bit of spread. And then uh, on the right is the same, but for using one hourly output to, to derive the forcing. And it's, you know, as you would expect, the more frequent uh, time resolution for the single column model forcing gets you better agreement with the UFS. Um, so in general, really cool functionality. Um, great job, Dustin. <laughs> um, OK, so in, in order to, to run the single column model, one needs to configure uh, both the case to run and the physics. 
So this diagram shows how that is done through a total of five external files. The green arrows represent the case configuration and the blue arrows represent the physics configuration. So the first file is that is needed is the case input data file. You know, it just contains things like the initial conditions and the forcing, um, which you know can be derived using any of the three methods that were discussed uh, previously. And this is what you know the the DEFI repo it is providing. So so files in you know their special format. It's it's this case input data file that that is. Uh, they're providing and that we also provide in, in our own repo and that I would like to see as, you know, a, a, the umbrella repo that I talked about. Uh, the second file further configures the single column model for a given case. Like it, it contains information like uh, the, the runtime. Um, hold on a second. Yeah, so the runtime, like the, the, the forcing type, um, the date, the column horizontal area that's that's supposed to be represented, that kind of thing. And then the other three files in this diagram all configure the, the physics. So and we've talked about some of these before. That, so there's the CCPP suite definition file, and that, that should look familiar to us. Um, along with the suite definition, there's also a file containing name list options for a given suite. And then the last file is just a, a list of tracers that a given physics suite expects. Um, based on what is included, um, um, yeah, a set of physics schemes ha will have a set of tracer variables that that it, it expects. And right now, there there's, it's not automatic. Like it, it would be nice if it was automatic, and the framework could could handle that. Maybe at some point, that'd be a nice feature to add, where it looks at a set of physics schemes and can spit out a set of um, tracers that are needed. So still something to think about. Um, so yeah, w with all these inputs, uh, the model, I'm sorry, was there a question? Maybe there was just uh, static on my line. OK. So so finally, the model produces um, you know, its net CDF output file. And you know, it's, it's typically configured to output instantaneous values of you know, whatever variables the user wants. Um, they, they happen to be hard coded, but you know it's in one file that, that the file that dictates what variables are output and it's easily editable editable. Um, yeah, and it's usually you know every time step and instantaneous for debugging purposes. but it, it can be configured to output less frequently or utilize time averaging you know like like all the other three-dimensional models. Um, but yeah, I mean since the, the SEM's footprint is so light, um, you know, Outputting instantaneous values at every time step um, for hundreds of variables is not really computationally prohibitive. Um, OK, so although the single column model is an independent software repository, there are many ties to, to NOAA's UFS that uh, bear mentioning, um, since it you know, exists sort of within the same software ecosystem. And many users and physics developers are of the single column model are probably interested in contributing to the UFS development. So um, in addition to the CCPP, I mean, what are these other ways? Um, the single column model can be configured to have, you know, many different vertical coordinates, but the default vertical coordinate is the same sigma pressure hybrid coordinate um, used in the FE3. Although the, there's a difference that, that the single column models is limited to be Eulerian, whereas of course, the FE3s is semi-Lagrangian. Um, the physics data structure um, and the physics name list are nearly identical between the single column model and an FE3. And by data structure, are, those are who, those are familiar. I'm talking about the type defs, like GFS type defs and CCPP type defs. They, they're nearly identical between the two with, with just some very minor differences. So this means that the single column model can be utilized by physics developers to test the CCPP interface in a much simpler model before transitioning the code quite straightforwardly to, to the UFS. And then as fine, uh, you know, as, as was mentioned yesterday, or not yesterday, um, a little bit ago um, by Dustin and myself, um, one can run individual columns from 
from previous uh, UFS simulations. So this is actually the, the last single column model slide that I was going to show. And at this point, I was going to do some code walkthrough type stuff. I think the, the first thing that I wanted to walk through was show some of the, the, the GitHub repositories themselves. Yeah, so so this is you know the, the CCPP physics repository. Um, a couple things I wanted to point out um, and that we're going to dis discuss tomorrow is if you look at the directory structure, it's, it's really flat. Basically, there's just one bucket for, for all of the physics schemes, whether they're primary, whether they're interstitial. Not that it technically matters, but it can make it intimidating to, to go through here and, you know, look at stuff. And so, I mean, not only are there the, all the, the schemes and their metafiles and all the interstitials, but also their dependencies. So, so everything's kind of in one bucket. I think it's crying out to be organized differently, but we haven't really thought of a good way to do it that, that everybody can agree upon. Um, right now, there's only one scheme that we're treating as a submodule, and this is the RRTMGP scheme, and Dustin talked about how that is is implemented. Um, yeah, and I was just going to say that we, we could pull updates from the submodule uh, when requested, like if, if, Dust, or if uh, Robert, you know, like I said, if if uh, you know there's a new update that that he really wants to test, or it, or he's already done the testing and it works really well in the UFS and we want to bring it in, then then we can update. All you have to do is update the commit hash. Um, otherwise, if we want to keep it static, you know we're we're in control of that. We control exactly what commit we are grabbing from this submodule. So that's that's kind of nice. Um, and I think it's good for both parties. They have control over um, their their own scheme repository, and we can grab whatever versions uh, we want. Um, and it's even possible, like they they could have a separate branch under their uh, submodule repository that they um, use for um, the CCPP. I, I mean, who knows? There, there are a lot of lot of options. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to show real quick was this code owners file that was talked about a bit. Uh, and it's very simple, but it's basically every file that's listed. Um, there is, um, well, not every file, most files, there is, um, there are some people listed, their GitHub usernames that they will receive notifications that there's a pull request and that they're re requested to do a code review. Um, so right now, like the uh, the CCPP code managers, which is myself, Ching Fu, and this is actually should be Mike Kavulich now, and, and it is in the UFS repository, but it used to be Dustin. Um, so so we're we're listed on on every file. We automatically get code reviews, and then those who are code owners um, get requests only when when you know the files that they're interested in or are authors of or or whatever otherwise responsible for. Um, whenever those files get changed. OK, so that, that's all I really wanted to show here. Um, let's see. For the CCPP framework repository, um, wasn't a ton I wanted to show. I was just going to mention that the vast majority of the important stuff that happens is in the, the scripts directory. Um, here is where we have, uh, this is that CCPP pre-build script that we've been talking about quite a bit. Um, and the conversion tools is where we have this unit conversion.py. And I mentioned that um, you have to like manually write a unit conversion between units if you want this, the framework to be able to handle the conversion automatically. And so this is where you would do that if you needed to add a new unit conversion. The, uh, let's see, some other interesting files. So make cap. This is the Python script that is actually 
auto-generating the Fortran code. So if we needed to change what's in the caps um, in some way, it's basically just editing the template that's found within this makecap.py. Um, and kind of the same thing with makestatic.py. This is what is making the CCPP API. And it's just, you know, there's a Fortran template that, that gets uh, filled in with uh, information that the CCPP framework gathers during the pre-build process. Um, yeah, but there's a template in there that gets uh, can get updated. And then the last one I wanted to show was, um, where is it? I'm looking for CapGen. Grant, oh, CapGen oh, is. is not in Maine, right? Uh, I, I think it. I think it is it's right here. It's not. Oh. I think Dom has been um, syncing these, or or had been up until recently, between the CapGen branch and the main branch. Um, but this is the the basically the next version of CCPP prebuild that NCAR is, is helping to develop that will be, um, that will not only work for NOAA models, but will also work for um, NCAR's uh, models and needs. Um, this has been something that's been ongoing um, and uh, looking forward because it adds some pretty neat capabilities. Um, all right, so what else? Oh, and then we have, the type definition for the CCPP type. Where is that? I, oh, it's not in the scripts directory. So I need to go back. Um, and I think that is in the source. Yeah, CCPP type. So this is where the CCPP uh, underscore T type is defined. And then the other thing was the stub that I think I, I mentioned in one of the answers for, for the questions on the comments. There's this, this you know, even simpler than a single column model uh, set of code that exercises the CCPP prebuild script. And there, it has its own prebuild config and, and, you know, fake data and fake scheme and that kind of thing. So, uh, something to look at if you're interested. OK, and then one last repo. Uh, this is just the uh, single column model repo. And there are a few things I wanted to point out. The first is we mentioned that the CCPP needs to be configured and that there is a one configuration file and then it's host model dependent. So. This is where it lives in the single column model, just you know, showing that yes, you do need it. And yes, it is host dependent. And yes, it stays with the host model. Um, we, we see both the, the framework and physics as submodules. And like Dustin was saying, this commit hash corresponds to um, commit hashes and the main branches on the NCAR forks of both physics and, and framework. And uh, these particular hashes are guaranteed to work with this current hash of the single column model. Um, they're not necessarily the, the latest hashes. They may be like a couple of weeks old, but they're very close to the top of main. Uh, no, no, it is the top of main, but it's, it's very close to the top of UFS develop because most of the development is going into the UFS first. Um, what else? Oh, the, the physics name lists. These are, um, you know, basically a, a subset of the name lists that are used in the UFS. Basically, only the the physics part. This is that's all we need for the single column model. But they're more or less identical to um, what is used in the UFS. And every release, we we double check and make sure that, uh, for example, like the nameless parameters in you know, this suite correspond to what's actually being used in uh, the, the UFS. 
and then some other important um, things you might want to be aware of is uh, I mentioned the data files that are needed as input for the single column model. So one is the, the case configuration file. This is where they live. Um, this includes both DEFI cases and then other ones that are um, that contributed by us. And then there's these tracer configuration files. And the, like I said, these tracers uh, are associated with, with suites uh, because each physics suite, the parameterizations within will expect um, potentially a different set of tracers. Um, and then the last thing is in source. We get quite a few questions about um, changing outputs for the single column model. And that all happens in this one file. And it's, it's I think that the, the template within here is fairly easy to follow. And it's just a matter of, you know, it's just basic net CDF output and you're setting it up initially so that you set up the variable to you know receive output and then every time that the the subroutine gets called to write out output it appends to the netcdf file and so there's a couple of places where you have to to put a new variable it's it's not particularly difficult to do so if you're interested in, in doing that definitely check out um, this file All right, so from here, I was wanting to check or sh show some examples of some of the code that we've been talking about um, in earlier talks. Um, so this is just a, an example of, you know, a, a CCPP scheme. And I picked MYNF, MYNN EDMF because I like Joe, and I'm pretty sure he wouldn't be mad if I showed it. Um, and it's a nice game. Um, and you know, it's written well and um, is a good example for several different things. Um, so first, you know, it's it exists in a module, the very basic thing. Um, it has um, the, the subroutines within it correspond to the CCPP phases. So here we have the, the, you know, the root name of the scheme with the underscore and the, the init for the init phase. And then if we do a search for subroutine, we'll see the run phase as well. Uh, I think those are the only two phases that are in here. Yeah, the other subroutines are just uh, helper routines. They're not CCPP phases. Totally fine to have not CCPP phases in here too. I don't think I mentioned that before, but there's there's nothing that says that all subroutines have to be exposed to the CCPP. That's yeah. Um, and then okay, we, we have these these special doxygen lines where we're when the doxygen is parsed, it actually um, takes the argument table and inserts it into the documentation. But we're we're also using this as our hook for the framework to say that, hey, this is a subroutine that needs to be uh, parsed by the framework. The physical constants for the MYNN scheme, they're, or, uh, Joe's using the, the second method because the scheme is it's pretty complex scheme. Um, and they were already using, I think, their own internal um, constants module. And so they can still do that. But here in the init phase, we are we're, so we're we're using this um, this this special like scheme specific uh, physical constants file, but we're passing in all of these that we're passing in are from the host, and so now we're 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 just setting all the constants in that module from the host, and in this way they can all be nice and consistent across physics schemes and the host and whenever Joe needs to use physical constants in the scheme, all he really needs to do is and you know continue to import this guy and he doesn't need to worry about passing things through the argument list. So really nice example of of doing that. 
Um, so I'm going to go down to the, the run phase real quick. And just a couple of examples of, um, let's see. Yeah. So uh, arrays here um, are using assumed, uh, assumed shape as is supposed to happen. Um, the labeled ends, so so every time there's a subroutine, etc., you know, it's it's labeled at the end to ends, you know, ed, end the subroutine, so and so. Um, let's see, he's using implicit none. Um, this isn't done at the module level, but it's it's fine. You can you can do it at the the subroutine level too. Just you know, a couple more lines. And then um, air handling. Um, this is exactly what you you're supposed to do. So so Joe's doing a check, is if all this is doing is if this scheme is put into an, an SDF, but this logical was not set properly in the initialization, in the host model initialization, it is letting you know about it, saying that, whoops, you have this scheme in your suite definition file, but you didn't set this flag correctly. And so it will it will stop. It sets the air flag something other than zero, returns, and then the, the host you know, will eventually output this error message. So all in all, nice job. Um, and then again, the, the other half of the scheme is the metadata. Um, and just, just to go through some of the things that we had talked about, um, there is one CCPP table properties for the, for the whole file. And that the name corresponds to the file and also the, the root uh, scheme name. It is of type scheme. And then this is a list of um, dependencies, things that need to get compiled prior to um, compiling the scheme. Actually, I don't think this, it shouldn't require physcons anymore now that he's done the constants thing, but um, so that's something we need to check on. Um, let's see. And then the CCPP arg table, this lists all the arguments for, so that there should be two of these, right? Because we have two CCPP phases that he's implemented. He's implemented the init phase and he's implemented the run phase. So we have, if I do a search for CCPP arg table, yeah, I get two results. So there's one here for init and there's one here for run. And, you know, for the init, he is just listing all of the arguments like you're supposed to do. Um, let's see. And for the run, same thing. And let's find an array. And remember, since this is the run phase, we're supposed to use this horizontal loop extent, which is not the MPI subdomain, that, but it's the, the smaller chunks out of the MPI subdomain. That's why we're using this horizontal loop extent, because the run phase happens on the, the block or the chunk level, not the MPI uh, subdomain level. Um, let's see. And if you actually looked in the Fortran and compared to the metadata, you would find that all of the intents match what is in the Fortran uh, perfectly. And that's certainly important to do. All right. So that was it here. I think that the next thing I wanted to do was quickly show, we talked about the standard names and that a dictionary existed. So let me go and it's ES comp standard names. Here it is. So here is this um, standard name dictionary. Um, and the things that are most relevant are, this is the actual list. This is a, a markdown version of the standard names that currently exist in the dictionary. And all it's, all it's included here is just the name itself and then a description and the units. I don't know that it really makes sense to have a type here, but it's there nonetheless. Um, let's see. And then, all right. The next important thing is we have a, a list of the rules. And this is, like I said, this is an extension of the climate and forecasting um, metadata or, or standard name conventions. Um, there, you know, 
if you start with a standard name, but then need a bunch of qualifiers saying, oh, this is at the surface or in, you know, in the atmosphere or in the water due to such and such process, there is a an order that CF specifies that name is constructed. Um, and all sorts of, you know, what I think are, are common sense rules. And again, the rules are, are meant to eliminate ambiguity such that the standard names can continue to be unique and unambiguous as possible. And then we have a list of qualifiers. This is this isn't exhaustive. It's a list that we're 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 trying to standardize. And you know, as new things come up, it will continue to grow. Um, but you know, it's just here so that we continue to you know try to standardize, and everybody can can coalesce along the same uh, names. And ultimately, if you coalesce along the same names, you get a lot closer to true interoperability. So. Um, it's not a nice, you know, I still think it's a work in progress. There's, there's a lot of stuff to do here um, to make it a little bit more useful, but uh, definitely a good start. All right. Um, the next thing I wanted to show was a sweet definition file. And we've already looked at this a little bit um, in, in the presentations. And, you know, I'll point out the same things that we have these four um, elements of the sweet definition file, uh, so those four XML ele elements, um, and then for we could do loops for the so for the for the surface uh, for the surface schemes. There's uh, 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 what do they call it? Um, well, you have a first guess, and then and then you refine that guess, and so that the loops are the, the, that's what the loop is for, and the schemes are set up to to expect that, so it knows when it's the the first time through the loop and the second time through the loop. Um, let's see. And then there's the differences between primary and interstitial. So like, for example, for the, the Thompson scheme, here's your primary scheme. And then we have, you know, uh, some scheme specific interstitials. And then we also have interstitials that get called for any microphysics scheme that are, that are generic to microphysics. Um, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to show in this sweet definition file. Um, all right, the next thing was the host metadata. So in the single column model, we have um, basically, we have, I think we have th actually three host metadata files. There's the GFS type defs and then CCPP type defs, which are the same as the UFS. And then there, there's one more for the, the physical constants, but I'm only showing the uh, the GFS type defs and CCPP type defs here. Um, OK, so for CCPP table properties, for this particular file, we should definitely have more than one, because this is a, a module that is defining a bunch of derived data types. And we're supposed to have one CCPP table properties, one for the module, and then one for every derived data type that has a definition. So if I do a quick search for however many there are, there are 11. And there should be an exactly same number oops, of table, of CCPP table properties. And there are, or, oops, arg tables, what I wanted. Are there 11? There are 11. OK, so they, they, should, they should match one to one. Um, Let's see, the names match exactly for uh, derived data types and uh, models or uh, modules. There are no intents anywhere to be found because it doesn't make sense within the host context. Um, all of the variables are using the horizontal loop extent in the host model, which is what you're supposed to do. And then let's see if we can find. Um, Let's see here, CLM like depth. All right, so I wanted to show this as the active attribute and then just uh, toggle between the metadata and the actual Fortran so you can show them. So I wanted to, so you can see what I'm talking about when I talk about this active attribute. So if you recall that this is useful for when this variable is only conditionally allocated 
And so this expression should resolve to uh, true or false um, for a given model run. And so if we actually looked at this variable, this is the, the, lo the local name of the variable. And if we look for it in GFS type defs, I want to see if we can find where this is this conditionally allocated. So let's do that. Well, darn it. So then copy it. Copy. Paste. OK. So here's where it is declared as a null pointer. And then, yep, sure enough, this is only allocated when we are using a lake model and then when the lake model is the CLM lake model. So that, that checks out. Um, and so that, that is a good example for the use of this active attribute. Um, the CCPP type defs.meta is actually really similar to the GFS type defs. And this was actually just recently split off of GFS type defs because GFS type defs was too long. <laughs> like I think some com compilers were having trouble with it or there was a memory issue or something like that. Um, but this, this, the CCPP type defs actually only um, has one uh, derived data type in it. It's called GFS interstitial type, but it, this is, all the variables in this type are variables that are ephemeral, meaning that they don't need to be saved from one physics time step to the next. Um, and the reason it made sense to split these off is because eventually, um, and I think that the NCAR folks um, would like to see this, is that the, the CCPP framework can allocate all these variables and the, all the ones that are don't need to be saved from time step to st time step can be allocated by the framework itself and don't have to be allocated by the host. But this is uh, its not the way it is yet, but I, I think uh, at some point um, this was uh, uh, a priority. All right. Um, OK, so the next thing I wanted to show you was CCPP prebuilt config. Again, this is the file that is it's host specific, and it is configuring CCPP prebuild um, for for how to run the you know how to produce it, it it tells it you know where the the host um host files are that that contain um data that the physics needs it it uh, has information about how the drive data types and module data is referenced in the the host model and Let's see. And then for first, it has all of has a list of all of the schemes that can be used in the single column model. So when the the, the prebuild script does its parsing, it's only going to look at this list. And so if you have a new scheme added and you want it to work in the single column model, one of the first things you got to do to try to compile it is is uh, or to you know to try to build it and compile it is to add it to this scheme list. Um, yeah, and, and the rest of it's basically just just paths, you know, like saying where that uh, where to put the output of the static API. We're going to put it with the rest of the source, um, and you know things like that. Okay. Okay. So um, I think there was a question about calling CCPP pre-builder, or maybe I'm just imagining that. But um, it can certainly be called by itself. There's there's nothing stopping you from, from calling the, the CCPP prebuild.py script and giving it suites, or giving it the path to this config file and a list of suites. But um, both the single column model and UFS has, have integrated the call in, into their build system. So if I look at the CMake lists, the, I should back up. The, the single column model is using CMake as its as its build system, and so um, this is a CMake list. This is what's contr what's con controlling the build system with CMake, and we will find a call to CCPP prebuild. Here is the the call for when the model is in debug mode. Here's the call for when it's not in debug mode, and here we have you know it's pointing to the config file. And it's pointing to 
a, a list of the suites to build it with, et cetera. So it's like, you know, it's exactly what you would do to call the script outside of the of CMake. Um, but here it's done as, as part of the, the CMake build. Uh, another nice thing is is it it has a, a standard place to put these uh, outputs from the CCPP pre-build script that you know give you information about what happened. It's basically a log for for the CCPP pre-build. Um, so let's see. I'm going to go ahead and oh, there's no way you're going to be able to see this. Um, oh yeah, okay, there it goes. Make this bigger. So this is just a terminal. Um, I have previously recloned the single column model earlier in the day. Um, so get clone. Oh, it's not showing up as in my past history. But just take my word for it. I I, I cloned um, a new version of the uh, the single column model this morning. And whoops. And so we want to just run the 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 CMake, which runs the CCPP prebuild script for us. So here is uh, you know it's kind of a, a long command, but we're, we're specifying in particular we want to process all of these suites. So we have our choice to run you know one of ten different suites in in the executable. And so let's go ahead and and do that. So we're going to run CCPP prebuild, and it will spit out a bunch of output outputs. Um, and then first thing I wanted to show you is the what the um, CCPP prebuild .air shows, and it tells you exactly what it's doing. Okay, it has all these suites that you, that you pass to it. Um, you know what it's parsing and eventually comes down here to, it actually filters out variables from the host that you don't need in the physics, and then in, in the physics that you specified. And if everything's successful, boom, you end up with this lovely line down here, um, completed successfully. And that's what we'd like to see. Um, I did mention earlier that, that one of the outputs from the pre-build script is a complete list of the variables that are um, available in the host. And so I'll show that real quick. It's really nice. Um, so this is automatically generated HTML. These are the, the standard names um, and more of, of all the, the variables that are available in this particular host. Um, you know, there's nothing fancy about the website, but it's, it's certainly useful. In the absence of a, a, a search tool for standard names, this is actually another way, nice way to see what's available. You can you can search through the, the list of names here. Um, of course we have the other metadata attributes with it, long name units, you know, rank. Um, and the, the last two columns are not part of the metadata, but it's really nice because it, it tells you exactly where this this variable is being um, declared and and how this variable is referenced from the code itself. So, you know, it's this string of derived data types and you get to the component of the data type and that's how you get to it um, in, in the code. Really, really nice to have this. I highly recommend, you know, when you're playing around with this, look at this file, especially if you're trying to write a new scheme for a specific host or something like that, um, invaluable uh, little resource. Um, all right, a few more things. Um, I, I mentioned that the CCPP prebuild.py script also um, helps the 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 the, uh, the rest of the build system out by by setting up these um, CMake or Makefile or there's just a, a script that will set an environment variable depending on what your build system consists of um, for for all of the the caps that are auto generated. And all the the schemes that need to be compiled, um, etc. So so this is, you know, the, these things that get ingested into the the single column model build system and the UFS build system. It uses these 
um, these lists that are set up from the uh, the pre-built script. Um, all right, the next thing is the CCPP um, API. And recall that we, um, this should have five methods, right? So let's go down to the public methods and here they are. And these are the ones that we talked about in, in the, uh, the slides. We have CCPP uh, physics time step init, time step finalize, the init, the run, and then final finalize if you go over to the right. So, so these are what the host actually you know, interfaces with. It calls these, these uh, uh, subroutines. Um, and let's see, it's importing all of these caps that are made because um, this, is, this is just you know, how, how it works. Like when, when the host calls init, let's say, so when it calls, this is time stepping in, I want it to look at init. So you call CCPP physics init to call the init stages of um, all the, the suite, uh, schemes in your suite. And you give it a at least a suite name and potentially a group name, optionally a group name. But depending on what you get it, this is the, remember this was auto-generated with that list of suites. So it, it knows um, how to handle that entire list of suites. So I am, if you're gonna at runtime use this suite, then you know it executes it for you. And all it does, if you give it a suite by itself, it executes um, you know, the entire thing. If you give it a group, it only calls the init for like one, one of the groups. So that is how the static API uh, works and looks like. Let's see if there's anything else I wanted to talk about. Um, let's see. The suite cap, so this is the, the top level uh, suite cap that can be called from that static API. For example, this guy exists in that suite cap. So here's a suite cap. If we, oh, I actually chose the wrong suite here. So if instead we're looking for V17P8. Yep, here it is. So this is a public method. It's been auto-generated. That's called from the API in here. And again, this is for the entire suite. And if we look in here, we will see that all this does is it, it knows all the groups in the suite. And so it just calls them sequentially in turn. If, however, from the CCPP static API, you actually gave it a group, it would bypass the suite cap and it would go directly to this the the appropriate group cap and so that's this is the physics group um and so the physics group um so here it's calling every scheme that has the init phase and then for the run where is it public Run cap, this guy. So this this should show um, this cap calling the run phases of all the schemes in, in the suite because they should all have well they don't all have to have run phases but most of them typically do. Anyway, and and see how all the the, the variables are referenced. So it's explicit arguments here. So this is what the the uh, the scheme expects and it the ccpp framework knows how to fill this out um you know where the data is found on the host side and this is what this is what's different between hosts right I anytime you call this this scheme um this ccpp physics scheme from any host the cap would have the same call and it would have these same arguments but for every host this is what is going to change where you find that data and that that's the 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 big um the big idea with uh, the ccpp um what else i think that's that's it on on the cap side that i wanted to talk about um 
Yeah, I will mention that. So, I mean, these caps, even though they're auto-generated, they are just Fortran. So for debugging purposes, if your CCPP pre-build completes successfully, but but you have a problem like a, a runtime error um, and you want to help debug it, you can certainly use these caps to help debug like you would a driver, like, like a, a, a hand-coded driver. So if you know the error happens between certain schemes, you can go ahead and put some write statements in here and and recompile and um it'll you know it'll it'll output those write st statements for you from this cap the issue is that i mean that's not permanent because this is an, an auto generated file right so the, the next time you run ccpp prebuild anything you put in these auto auto generated uh caps you know is going to disappear of course but um you can still use these as you would a physics driver in that sense to to help debug i think the the very last thing i was going to show if anybody is still listening <laughs> is um i was going to show the difference between running in debug mode and not so if i do cmake i think i already did one earlier yeah so to, to run it in debug for the single column model, all you have to do is add this, this extra um, argument for CMake that says use the debug build. It will run through and do the thing, run CCPP prebuild, and uh, it will output, um, it will do a couple different things. Um, so this is an example of the difference between uh, regular mode or release mode and debug mode for the CCPP pre-build like air file, the log file. And there is just a vast amount of information that gets added um, to wade through <laughs> on debug. I've I never actually used this <laughs> to, to debug anything, but heck, if you, if you need to know anything about what's happening in CCPP pre-build, and debug mode, it tells you every little thing. So that's it's it's nice if you need it, but there's a lot of info. And then um, I also mentioned that the debug mode on the cap side, it adds an additional um, uh, array checks. So we'll just look at that. This is just one of the the group caps, and we indeed see that it's adding these additional array bounds checks uh, for us as as part of debug mode. So believe it or not, um, that is uh, everything I wanted to walk through. And we are three minutes toward our, or away from our hard limit. So um, I guess I will open it up for a couple of questions that we have time for. Um, let me stop sharing my screen, or maybe I'll keep it. Jimmy, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I was wondering if um, I, um, maybe I missed it. Can, can we see the uh, CCPP interface from the host side? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. I didn't show it, but um, let's see. So there, it's in a couple different places in the single column model. Would you like to see the UFS or the single column model? I think the single column model. OK. They should look the same or similar, right? Um, no, because. Um, the single column model and UFS did something a little bit different. Um, the, the UFS put all of the CCPP interfaces into an extra uh, driver layer, whereas the single column model is just calling it directly from the code that previously you know, had existed. So um, uh, without an, an extra layer of, of driver. Yep. So let's see here. The, the main CCPP API calls are going to be in this, this main um, module. This is the, the main single column model. And here I am. I'm importing the CCPP static API. All of these methods, these five methods, are available for the, the single column model to use. So if I search for CCPP physics init, um, all right. So here we are calling CCPP physics init. init. We're giving it a sweet name. And this is coming in from, um, what is this coming in from? Um, the, the run script, basically. 
So that there's the init phase, and then it's checking, you know, if if an error occurred, exit out, and if we want to do time stepping time stepping it and run. Um, so the, the first time step is actually handled in the, in the main routine. So this is what's happening in the first time step. It's calling time stepping it, um, and then run, and then time step finalize. And then for for most of the physics, uh, or sorry, most of the uh, time integration, the single column model calls this separate module for um, SDM time integration. Again, we're using CCPP static API, and Every time step, we need access to these three methods. So let me just search for CCPP physics. So here we are. This is this is, um, and what is this? This opportunity is called do time step. Yeah, very simple, right? Um, and we have the time stepping it. Again, with a single column model, we're, we're calling the whole suite at a time because we don't need to do anything between groups. But if you were doing um, if you needed to do something between groups, like the FE3 does, you would give it a group two, and then do do whatever you need to do between groups, and then go, you know, call the rest of it. Um, so there's time stepping it, physics run, and then time step finalize, and that that's basically it. That is the interface from single column model to the CCPP in the code. 